This is the Mazda 3, and it's from the 2010s. Despite that, it is incredibly low drag. Back then, it achieved a drag coefficient of just 0.28, which is decent even by this generation's standards. But that's not the most impressive bit. The most impressive bit is how it managed to get such a low drag coefficient, as we'll see. So much of the Mazda 3 isn't any better or worse than a regular car. For example, it's almost a hatchback. There's only a small little trunk at the back. That naturally should mean its drag coefficient should be in the low 0.3s or so. So how did it get such a low drag coefficient then? That's what we're looking at in this video. And this simulation was commissioned by one of your amigos. If you'd like to commission us to simulate your very own car, let us know here. So the first very good part of this car is the front lip. Look at how well the flow travels underneath it. There's no separation, no chaos. That might not seem like much, but this small region has major ramifications for not only the flow in this region, but also the rest of the underbody too. Because the flow stays attached here, we get low pressure, but more than that, it's stable low pressure. That means that the downforce that this region creates, because the low pressure is sucking the front down, remains consistent as you drive, and the drag we get here is minimal too. But looking at the flow past this region, it remains very well behaved. That means the underbody is fed with high quality flow, and that high quality flow makes it almost to the diffuser as well. So the underbody can perform better here too. And looking at the pressure plot, we see exactly that. Stable, low pressure is generated here. That's really good. That sucks the car down too, and produces more downforce with relatively little drag. And that is actually harder to do than it might seem because while performance cars produce more and more downforce by getting lower to the road, for modern cars with smooth underbodies, lowering too much actually increases their drag. Shifting over from this center plane to half a meter to the left, this region is even better now. The flow still remains attached and is very high speed, funneling high energy flow underneath the car and lowering the pressure to produce more downforce here too. Mazda achieved this by simply making the front lip slanted up a little. Instead of being a sharp right angle, it's more of a 45 degree chamfer or so, which then leads to the underbody. That is very good for this car's aerodynamics, both for lowering the drag and increasing the downforce. Another region that is very impressive is the hood. It's curved down nicely. By doing that, it helps the flow at the front to travel over it more seamlessly. The only drag we get is at the front lip, but that's because the flow at the front gets caught up here and between the front grille and the hood. And because the hood is so curved, it does a great job directing the flow to an angle that isn't too different to the windshield. We do get some of the flow hitting the windshield and decelerating, as we can see by this green section here, but it's not really that bad compared to many other cars. So the flow can travel over the windshield and maintain quite high energy still. That's very good. And in fact, many other cars, and cars quite a bit more expensive than this one, do a much worse job here. For example, the SQ5, which features a major problem here as the flow circulates around and produces a surprising amount of drag. Moving over half a meter to the left, things get a little more interesting. The hood is curved down so much that it's almost hard to tell where the front ends and where the hood starts. As you can see by the streamlines, the flow starts redirecting quite early, and the hood is angled perfectly to collect that flow. So it travels seamlessly over this junction onto the hood, and this time, without any drag created. Moving to the rear, we now see the thing that is quite surprising for this sedan. It has almost a hatchback kind of look, but just at the last second, a little trunk is just thrown in. And surprisingly, that's enough to shrink the wake down. The rear window is sloped down quite a lot, but one very good thing this Mazda did was blend the roof into the rear window. That means that the eventual angle of the rear window isn't seen until well past this junction, and the sloping is shared over a much greater length. As such, the flow here is in no danger of separating, causing a wake, or creating drag. 
The same general curvature is kept when we move to the left plane too, and the trunk is now even better blended into the rear window. So as the flow comes down, it even wraps around the lip a little. That is very rare to see. In fact, this rear lip is one of the most unusual parts of this car. There's definitely a lip here, but it doesn't fulfill the same function as the lips seen on many other cars. Usually, a lip is added to the trunk to kick the flow up just at the last minute. That small lip, surprisingly, increases the downforce quite a bit. But with that comes a much bigger wake and more drag. Here though, it seems like the lip is added for another reason. It's added as a way to trigger separation at a certain point. It might seem odd that you'd want to do that, because that creates a larger wake then and usually more drag. But here, doing that actually can reduce the drag. What happens is that a more stable wake is formed, and that over time reduces the drag. For those interested, we covered the exact same idea in this podcast episode. Looking at the drag orbit, we can see just how little drag is formed. Mazda did a great job reducing the drag in the wake, and that is in large part why its drag coefficient is so low over a decade ago. But while this little lip does a great job of shrinking the wake and reducing the drag, another region is arguably even better. The flow around the rear wheels. Usually flows around the rear wheels cause a lot of problems for a car, particularly when it comes to the diffuser. Usually the wakes flow in and provide the diffuser with bad flow. That then reduces effectiveness, so the flow isn't shot into the wake nearly as well. That then makes the wake worse and more drag is produced. Here, we definitely do get rear wheel wakes, but the way they interact with the diffuser isn't as bad. You can see how the flow is struggling to be good. There are pockets of bad flow hitting the diffuser, but there are also pockets of good flow too. That improves the diffuser's performance, and that reduces the wake size and the drag produced. In this top view, the rear wheel wake definitely isn't angled in much, it remains straight, and that is key to keeping this wake from encroaching more into the diffuser. And this straightness is confirmed with this streamlined orbit. So the Mazda does a very good job managing the rear wheel wakes here, and by doing that, it provides the diffuser with better flow, and that reduces the drag. As a side note, did you know that this simulation was done with open foam? It's a free and very powerful safety software. And if you're interested in learning it, check out our courses here. Now, while the Mazda does a great job managing the rear wheel wakes, that's not the only way it manages the wheel wakes either. In these planes, 40 centimeters and 60 centimeters off the ground, the wakes from the wheels are surprisingly small. At 40 centimeters off the ground, the front wheels have pretty much no wake. That is very impressive. Some cars are comparable to this, but most aren't. And in this drag orbit, we can see how the drag from the front wheel is concentrated lower down. Even at 60 centimeters off the ground, the wake out of the top of the wheelhouse is very good. Often, there will be much larger wakes here as the flow inside the wheelhouse is struggling to flow somewhere to escape. The top is one of the easiest areas to do that, but in doing so, it also creates more wake and more drag. Here though, the drag is minimal. And for the rear wheels, this region is even better. Far less drag all round. So one of the major reasons why this Mazda 3 has such a low drag coefficient is how well it handles the wheel flows. And that minimizes the wakes and drag. But with all of these great features, does that mean that the Mazda is perfect? Well, no. Despite all these great features really reducing the drag, there are parts that could be improved. For example, the front. It's blocky. And especially considering that this car does have sleek styling, the hood curvature is great, but they could have shrunk the front even more. The reason you'd want to do that is because as it stands, the large front means more surface area exposed to very high pressure air. We get high pressure here because the flow is coming in at a free stream speed and with free stream kinetic energy. It then slams into the front and has to decelerate greatly as it tries to move out of the way. That then increases the pressure, which pushes the car back and increases the drag. So not curving, but also slanting the hood down more, 
would help reduce the front surface size and reduce the drag coming from it. Another region that could be improved is actually the diffuser in the center plane. It's pretty good, but surprisingly, it's not that much better than half a meter over to the left. That plane has much worse flow to work with, and yet the flow under the diffuser is still pretty good. In the center plane, the diffuser, while decent, isn't perfect. There is still some minor turbulence and flow separation. That is because there is some roughness underneath that is tripping up the flow. So smoothing that more would help. And really, anytime you improve or deprove the diffuser, the wake changes a lot too. It gets much larger or much smaller, and the drag changes accordingly too. So minor improvements to the diffuser here really help reduce the drag coefficient a lot. If the diffuser were improved here, this already respectable 0.28 drag coefficient might drop to 0.27 or even 0.26. What's more, while the Mazda already does pretty well with drag coefficient, the lift is kind of a different story. At 72 kph, it produces 12.3 kilos of lift. That isn't great. I mean, there are many cars on the list that produce more lift, but that is at higher speeds too. Here, 72 kph isn't that high, but 12.3 kilos is. So the car has a problem with lift. Looking at the pressure plot in the center plane, it's pretty easy to see why. The roof and hood produce very low pressure that sucks the car up, and that produces lift. So a better diffuser would help reduce this lift overall too. On the top, there are some minor regions like the junctions between the hood and windshield and the rear window and the trunk that produce high pressure, and that then pushes the car into the road, which is downforce, but they're not enough. And in fact, if you were to try to exaggerate these regions to produce even more downforce, that would be much worse for drag. The diffuser and underbody provide you regions that can produce downforce without a drag penalty. And in some cases, improvements there can even drop the drag coefficient too. And actually, looking at the left plane, over the window trunk junction, there isn't any high pressure here anymore. That brings us to the next problem the Mazda 3 has. Looking at the velocity plot, you can see a couple problems in this area. The first is a green streak forms about here. Looking at the streamlines, that's because the flow wraps around the C pillar here, and then it flows down the rear window. Then coupling this with a thick boundary layer forming over the trunk, as we can see by this larger green layer, that all means that the rear flow has less energy to work with. So the wake won't be as high energy, and that means more drag in general. So while the Mazda 3 is very impressive when it comes to the drag coefficient, it's not perfect, and there are several key areas that could be improved upon still. But maybe the most surprising thing is that while this Mazda 3 is impressive, there's another cheap car out there with even better aerodynamics. Check it out here. And finally, did you know that we recently launched our RC airplane design course? In it, you'll learn how to design and build your very own UAVs so you can go out, test them, and fly them. It's a lot of fun. Check it out on our website. Peace out, amigos.